Welcome back to the Complete History of Coffee, Episode 7, Dawn of Revolution. Grab your favorite caffeinated beverage and let's get started. To begin, here's a preview of what's going on in our Members Only episodes. Complete History of Wine, member episode 2. I'm your host, Ara Zaffer. Today, I am drinking a pink Moscato, and I know some of you are probably going to give me a hard time about that, but I'm not a big wine drinker, so I decided to go easy on myself. Um, and I'm going to be pairing that with a pink lemonade. So I'm going to start by smelling it. So definitely smells very uh, sweet, very fruity. Um, let me go ahead and try tasting it. So it is a carbonated wine. It's definitely very sweet overall. I'm getting a lot of the fruity notes. This one in particular had a raspberry flavor to it. So I'm definitely getting a lot of that raspberry. Um, let me try some of the lemonade with that. It is an interesting contrast between the two because the lemonade actually has a little bit of a, uh, a tartness to it. Whereas the wine has a little bit of a bitterness, but I mean, it's really covered up by the sweetness. It's really easy to miss. So it's undetectable. It is a pretty interesting pairing because it definitely brings out two different aspects of fruity and brings out different aspects between sweet, tart, and bitter. The Epic of Gilgamesh tells the story of a woman who was suffering from a migraine and wished to end her suffering. She attempted to take her own life by drinking a jar of poisonous grapes. As it turns out, this jar of grapes was not lethal and instead made her drunk. Clearly, this old jar of grapes is talking about wine and based on personal experience the poor woman in the story likely had her migraine worsen as a result of consuming this alcoholic beverage in any case she realized the drink was delicious and shared the discovery with others in another myth from mesopotamia from around 3000 bce in modern day iraq we see the first goddess of wine and in fact most cultures that followed also made their deity over wine a goddess rather than a god. The Sumerians and Indus Valley people had goddesses over wine, as did Egypt, who had Isis, as well as her husband Osiris, over winemaking. One obvious exception, of course, were the Greeks, who had the god of theater, pleasure, and wine, Dionysus, later incorporated into Rome as Bacchus. All of these deities, male and female, were gods over fertility. Clearly, there was a link within these ancient civilizations between wine and fertility. Bacchus was often seen as a lesson of moderation in drinking, as those who drink in moderation will be happy and cheerful, because, as they believed, going too hard will make you get into trouble and act stupidly. Euripides used the Greco-Roman god as the main character in his work, the Bacchae. Quote, Young man, two are the forces most precious to mankind. The first is Demeter, the goddess. She is the earth, or any name you wish to call her. And she sustains humanity with solid food. Next came Dionysus, son of the virgin, bringing the counterpart to bread, wine and the blessings of life's flowing juices. His blood, the blood of the grape, lightens the burden of our mortal misery. Though himself a god, it is his blood we pour out to offer thanks to the gods, and through him we are blessed. End quote. It is interesting some of the parallels we can start seeing between Dionysus and the later Messiah of Christianity, Jesus Christ. But we're not going to get into that story this episode. We will eventually come back to that when we talk about the Eucharist. Looking at the historical record. If you would like to hear the rest, head over to Patreon and search for the Complete History Podcast Series. Or by finding a link to our Patreon on our social media pages. There once was a god of fertility who rode on a chariot pulled by Tangrinsna and Tangusna, 
Two goats whose names mean teeth thin and teeth grow respectively. This mighty god was Thor, consumer of beer and coffee. Or at least in the Marvel Universe, he was a fan of coffee. Just drink, I like it. I know, it's great, right? Another! Most people think of Thor as the Norse god of war, yet he is also over fertility, just like our other deities of wine. It is interesting, however, he never tried coffee in Asgard or his time in our world. Possibly this is because of his strong desire to drink beer, or I suppose because of Thor is simply a mythological figure. But if we wanted to consider this legend like the legend of Kaldi, then perhaps this is because of Coffee's late arrival to Scandinavia. Coffee arrived in Scandinavia in 1685, putting it behind many other countries in Europe who already had their first coffee houses open years before this point. Around 1715, a statesman named Claes Rallem was the first to chronicle it, describing his hatred for the drink. Similar to other parts of Europe, coffee was initially used as a medical supply rather than a morning stimulant. Sweden's king, Charles VII, was the first to encourage coffee as a drink for pleasure after visiting Turkey and seeing their coffee culture. Initially a drink for the aristocracy, it gained enough popularity by 1710 to merit the first coffee house in the region. Sweden's government moved to limit coffee by decreasing all imports and increasing all of the country's exports. There were eventually five bans on coffee, with the first being in 1756 and lasting a decade, and the last one ending in 1822. The first ban included fines, the potential for having your coffee saucer taken away, or even imprisonment. King Gustav III wanted the drink banned so badly, he convicted the Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus, a coffee enthusiast, to write a dissertation on coffee's ill effects. He also went on to conduct what is jokingly referred to as Sweden's first clinical study. Using two twins that were condemned to death for his trial, one twin would drink a heavy amount of coffee every day, while the other was to consume tea. Today, there is a word in Swedish, fika, which translates to something like coffee and cake break, and is a social activity in which people sit down and drink coffee together and have a pastry. This episode, I want to continue our story in Italy. Take a brief look at coffee in Russia and then transition to France where we wrap up with Europe next episode by taking a look at England. Before coffee even arrived in Venice, Venetian traders were trading with the Middle East and were apparently causing conflict with locals there as we have Ottoman records of complaints about this misconduct being sent to Sultan Rustin Pasa. After coffee's arrival in Italy, it took several decades for coffee houses to become mainstream. Apothecaries were originally the place to go for the exotic bean. As a result, these apothecaries became places for socializing and sharing information. In fact, even after first coffee houses began appearing in Venice, these apothecaries were still important places for conversation until the 18th century. Father Paul describes Venetian coffee houses, stating, quote, The Venetians do not allow any coffee houses in their city that are able to contain great numbers of people. Their coffee houses are generally little shops that will not hold over five or six persons at a time, and perhaps here are not seats for above two or three. So the company, having nowhere to rest themselves, are gone as soon as they have made an end of drinking their coffee. End quote. It is still common in Italy today to stand at a counter while drinking your espresso. Café Florian is the world's oldest coffee house in continuous operation, hosting people like Carlo Goldani, Lord Byron, and Charles Dickens. The café also took after Viennese coffee houses with the use of newspapers, such as Gossi's early newspaper Gazzetta Veneta. It originally had only two furnished rooms, but by the mid-18th century, it had expanded into four rooms. The cafe's 
four rooms were elegantly refurbished in 1858, despite public outcry against doing so. The Sala del Senato utilized a theme of progress and civilization instructing the nations. There was also the Hall of the Illustrious Men, which was decorated with paintings of famous Venetians. Another room, the Hall of Seasons, or Hall of Mirrors, was decorated with figures of women who represented the Four Seasons. And finally, decorated with hand-painted mirrors, the Sala Liberty was added in the beginning of the 20th century. Florian began hosting the International Exhibition of Contemporary Art in 1893. Known today as the Biennale di Veneza, it has acted as a display for various artists, from painters and sculptors to photographers and cartoonists. In 2003, the Hall of Illustrious Men was joined by 10 notable Venetian women, painted by Irene and Desner. Florian still hosts paintings and music today, and in recent years has branched out to other parts of Italy and even internationally. Rome gained its first coffee shop in 1650, opened on the Campus Martius by a Jewish resident. Much like coffee history thus far, this saw a lashback from people in Rome. One such man, Dr. Lodovico Mortoli, in 1674, stated, quote, This type of bean that comes from abroad and is popularly known as coffee has only recently arrived in Rome, where it is being sold for public consumption. It is ordered that nobody of any nationality or status may sell or administer this coffee to anybody unless it has first been approved by us and given written permission. End quote. Cafe Greco was opened in Rome by a man from Greece in 1760. Patrons to the cafe included Stendhal, Goethe, Lord Byron, Ibsen, Hans Christian Andersen, Wagner, and Casanova. Café Albaicirin, meaning little cup, is the oldest surviving coffee house in Turin, was opened in 1763. It hosts the traditional Turin drink, Bicerin, a layered espresso drink with chocolate and whole milk. This drink is believed to have been based on the Bavarisa, a drink from the 17th century, which was essentially the same, but was mixed instead of layered. Frederick Nietzsche tried a bicerin and stated it was, quote, scorching hot, but it is delicious, end quote. Noting female influence on the cafe, Kyron Cook commented, quote, Turin's cafes were once a male preserve meeting place for merchants and literati. Bicerin was different. Opened in 1763, it has always been owned and run by women, end quote. In 1780, Café Fio Rio was opened in Turin, quickly becoming a place for artists, intellectuals, and the ruling class. It became known as the Café of the Machiavellis and the Pigtails. Machiavelli, referring to the Italian philosopher who wrote The Prince, who is more or less the opposite of what the actual word Machiavelli means, and Pigtails, referring to pre-revolutionary hairstyles worn by reactionary politicians. On a side note, we can thank the French for giving us the political use of the words reactionary, conservative, and right, which all come from those who wish to stay with the status quo of despotism. Antonio Predoci opened the Predoci Cafe in 1831 in the city of Padua. It was decorated in a neoclassical style and became known as Cafe Without Doors because it was open day and night. People would read books and newspaper, women were given gifts of flowers, and when it rained, customers were lent umbrellas. Similar to coffee's role in past political fervor and, as we will see shortly, revolution, this cafe is famous for its role in the riots against the Habsburg monarchy in the 1848 Spring of Nations. An iconic image of coffee is the Mechanetta, the stovetop aluminum coffee making device, which looks like a coffee pot of sorts, was created by Bialetti in 1933. Italian coffee culture, even to this day, pushes for decorum and innovation. If you want an espresso, simply order un café, and you will get a strong shot of coffee with a cup of water. 
Cappuccinos are a breakfast item, and like McDonald's breakfast menu, they are not ordered after 11 a.m. in Italy. Everywhere in Italy has its own specialty coffee, such as a Cafe Anaceti, a hazelnut cream coffee in Naples, a Cafe du Perino in Sicily, inspired by Arabian cloves, cinnamon, and chocolate, or the Neapolitan Cafe Sospeso tradition of buying two coffees and leaving the second one for a stranger to enjoy. Switching gears to take a quick look at Russia, coffee was introduced by Tsar Peter the Great after a trip to the Netherlands in the early 18th century. Although at first most people found it to be displeasing in taste, describing it as dirty syrup. Peter continued serving it at his court until it caught on in popularity. Shortly after Peter's reign saw Tsarina Anna Ivanovna, who was said to have drank coffee every morning. Russia's first coffee house came at around 1720 or 1740 in St. Petersburg, placing it under either Peter or Anna. The coffee house was named after a military victory against Sweden, after Russian forces captured four enemy frigates. Russia obtained most of its coffee from Africa until the Russo-Turkish War prevented access to these trade routes. War with France, however, increased coffee's popularity among Russian troops, and influential figures such as Catherine the Great created a great demand for coffee. During the 18th century, coffee became a luxury item for the upper class, but was sought after by the middle class. The Russian Revolution did little to change this. Where tea was being supplemented by lower quality Russian tea, coffee could not be grown in any capacity in Russia's climate. While there was a Russian brew made from firewood known as Ivan Chai, coffee more or less disappeared after the Russian Revolution. This was due in part to the collapse of the Russian economy after 1917, but also because of the Soviet Union's prioritization of industrial goods over luxury items. Pre-revolution coffee houses in St. Petersburg and Moscow survived the revolution, but it took until World War II for coffee to become popular again as a result of supplying soldiers with coffee. Now, to wrap up with France, there was a man, Lefebvre, who sold coffee in the streets of Paris, around the time Café Procope in 1689. Eventually, Lefebvre opened his own café near Palais Royal, later selling it in 1718 to a man named Leclerc. The café was renamed Café de la Régence, so-called after the regent of Orleans at the time. Louis XIV discovered coffee trees don't tolerate frost well, and so had a greenhouse built to supply him with coffee. In fact, many believe his royal supply of coffee went on to be used in Central and South America. Unlike Louis XIV, who did little to encourage coffee in France, King Louis XV attempted to encourage coffee culture to please his mistress and was said to have spent $15,000 a year on coffee for his daughters. In 1720, there were 280 cafes in Paris, that number growing to 600 under Louis XV, and reaching 3,000 by the mid-19th century. These cafes served as places for Parisians to socialize and play the lottery or a game of checkers. Most cafes had pipes for customers to smoke tobacco from, as this was such commonplace in Paris at the time. Social status played a role in which area of the cafe customers were to sit at, as the fittings and furnishing varied to match the social hierarchy. Some cafes had seating outside for overflow customers, and those on the outskirts of the cities allowed people to experience pastoral scenery. Unlike cafes with the stereotypical white girl getting her pink drink at Starbucks, Cafes in France at this time were a masculine aspect of society. Many cafes were owned by couples, however, with women often running the front of house and men acting as a sort of barista making drinks in the back. 
Women in France were not banned from entering cafes like in other countries, but often felt it was taboo, as typically the only females in cafes were prostitutes. Women did still order coffee, but it was typically taken out to their carriage for private consumption. Many bourgeoisie women preferred chocolate, but coffee overtook chocolate after the innovation of the café au lait. A café au lait is half coffee and half hot milk. France took a special liking to this new beverage as it not only enhanced the taste, but also served as a unique French drink. A noblewoman in 1690 stated, quote, We have here good milk and good cows. We've taken it into our heads to skim the cream and mix it with sugar and good coffee. They're able to recreate 17th century coffee, and people today describe the taste as appalling or even disgusting. So why did coffee houses grow in such popularity? It is largely due to the social interaction, or as the old Turkish saying goes, quote, not the coffee nor the coffee house is the longing of the soul. A friend is what the soul longs for. Coffee is just the excuse, end quote. Coffee grew in popularity during this time as colonial sugar began making its way into European society. Dufault describes the sugar that was added to coffee as so much that the coffee, quote, was nothing but a syrup of blackened water, end quote. As we mentioned before, cafes in France served as spots for intellectualism, helping fuel the so-called Age of Enlightenment and even after this movement came to an end, the café was still the place for exchanging ideas, conceptualizing art, and philosophizing great concepts. One such place was Café de Flore, which opened up shop in 1890, quickly becoming a spot for the great artist Picasso, the original writer Hemingway, and the creators of existentialism Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre. Potentially more important, though, were cafes in the last decade of the 18th century. Café de Faux was opened, and 40 years later would come to fame after a speech given on one of the café tables on July 12, 1789, by Comi de Moa. Two days later, as a result of his speech, a mob stormed the Bastille, officially igniting the French Revolution. Thomas Carlyle, in his book, the French Revolution, described the speech as, quote, But we see Camille Desmois from the Café des Faux rushing out, the blind in the face, his hair streaming, in each hand a pistol. He springs to a table. This time he speaks without stammering. Friends, shall we die like hunted hares, like sheep hounded into their penfold, bleeding for mercy, where there is no mercy, but only a wedded knife. The hour has come, the supreme hour of Frenchman and man, when oppressors are to try conclusions with oppressed, and the word is swift death, or deliverance forever. Let such hour be well come, us, meseems. One may only cry befits to arms. End quote. Cafes continued their crucial role in the revolution, even after it began, such as Georges Janton gathering a mob at Café Procope the day after the attack on the Bastille, and marching them down to City Hall, demanding for change. Two years later, guilds were banned from meeting in their official houses and halls, and so began meeting in cafes instead. Across the Atlantic, there was another major revolution, one which made way for the revolutions of 1848, helped lead France and Russia to their revolutions, and would create the largest coffee consumer in the world, even to this day. I speak, of course, about the American Revolution. The show is written and produced by me, Era Zaffer. If you have not already, please consider supporting this podcast series on Patreon. For the price of a latte a month, you can support this and future projects in this series. Make sure to join our communities on social media at the Complete History Podcast Series. If you would like to contact us, you can message us through social media or at our email, completehistorypod at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. And make sure to share it with your family, friends, co-workers, or maybe that special someone in your life. 
close, here's a quote from 19th century French politician Narcy Arquet de Salavadi. Speaking about the importance of conversations and opinions formed within coffee houses, he stated, quote, No government can go against the sentiment of the cafes. The revolution took place because they were for the revolution. <laughs>